Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries RPG podcast with John and Hannah. Hi. And today we're going to be talking about the benefits of having a clearly defined sequence of play in RPGs. And we're going to be highlighting examples from Old School Essentials by Necrotic Gnome. Okay, so what do I mean when I'm talking about a clearly defined sequence of play? Effectively, I'm talking about a a sort of bullet point list that you can follow to resolve a certain aspect of play. The sort of thing that you'd have on the middle of your GM screen because it's the most important thing that you keep coming back to every time. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of people, myself included, we take this for granted. We've been playing role play games for ages. Mm -hmm. So we all just sort of fall into the pattern of knowing like what sequence things should take when you're going through a dungeon or whatever. But I've recently been reading through the Old School Essentials books because I'm going to be running that in the future now my mm-hmm. ICRPG game on Fridays come to an end. Um, and as I've been reading through it, aside from realising that a lot of what I thought I knew about basic D&D is like a mishmash of various other versions of d and I've read, one of the things that really struck me is the game has very clearly laid out procedures for how you handle certain things. So in this case, dungeon adventuring, wilderness adventuring, and waterborne adventuring in the core rules book. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure other versions of D&D might have had this in. I did have a quick look through my print-on-demand copy of the D&D rules cyclopedia, but this is the clearest I've found it laid out. So to give you some examples, the sequence of play per turn in dungeon adventuring as far as OSE is concerned is first of all the ref makes a check to see if there's a wandering monster second the party decides what actions they want to take three the ref describes what happens if monsters are encountered you then move on to the encounter procedure and four you end the turn the ref updates their time record you know like spell durations whether your torch goes out stuff like that whether you need to rest and then you go go back to the start and you do for the next turn The one for wilderness adventuring is very similar. You start off by deciding what direction you want to travel in. You then make a roll to see whether your group loses direction or whether they manage to stay the course. The ref makes a wandering monster check. The ref then describes what terrain you've passed through, any sites of interest. If there's any monsters encountered, you go on to the encounter procedure. Then finally, you get to the end of the day. The ref updates the time record. You consume your rations, etc., etc. You go back to the start of it for the next wilderness exploration turn. And the waterborne adventuring one is very similar. You decide your course, see if you lose direction. The ref determines the wind conditions. You make a check for any wandering monsters like krakens or anything like that. Although I'm hoping there probably won't be too many like random wandering krakens because they're mm-hmm. a bit feisty. The ref then describes what happens. You then get to the end of the day. The ref updates their records. You go back to the start of the turn, etc. And there's also an encounter procedure as well, which I won't go into because we're all pretty familiar with that. You know, roll for surprise, encounter distance initiative, do your actions, etc., etc. But one of the things I like about this is because it breaks down essentially the whole game or like everything you would do in a traditional D&D game into a series of sort of modular little encounters. So if you're wandering through the wilderness and you get to stage three when the ref goes, oh, you find the the ancient broken down remnants of an old tomb and you go, all right, we're going to explore that. The ref can then go, right, well, I'll just flick to the dungeon exploring procedure, start from there. And it's all very clear, you know, you just follow these bullet points down, follow the actions that it said. And certainly if you were a less experienced dungeon master, because like I say, a lot of us who are a bit more experienced tend to do this anyway, because we're just so used to it. But I think if you were coming to D&D as a newer sort of GM, or maybe you wanted to GM for the first time, having that sort of black and white framework there, which tells you, like, this is what you should be doing in a dungeon, this is what you should be doing in the wilderness, would be very useful. Because I know some games, they just tend to sort of throw you in at the deep end, they give you a bit of vague general advice, and you're expected to somehow piece that together. Mm -hmm. And obviously you can do, but it's a far more daunting task than having a procedure that pretty much leads you through it and sort of teaches you how to run the game. This is a thing that we've talked about before, I think, about the layouts of books. Yes. And how important it is to have that sort of information somewhere where it's easy to find 
and clear to follow. Yeah, one of the one of the advantages of old school essentials, and I know I'm sort of big in old school essentials up for a lot, and I'm quite a fan of it, so that's not really a surprise. But one of the advantages of it is it's very clearly laid out. Obviously, you guys can't see the copy of the the core rules book I'm looking at, but on the every sort of procedure is on a single double page spread in this book. So for the dungeon adventuring procedure, you've got a little box out that gives you the sequence of play and then clearly defined sections that tell you the sort of things you might need to look at, you know, like doors, listening at doors, movement in a dungeon, resting, searching, traps and wandering monsters. And that's all on a double page spread. So when your players are exploring a dungeon, you open your book to the dungeon adventuring bit You've got it all there. You can follow that. Uh, aside from like checking monster stats and a few other bits and pieces, it's all on that double page spread. You're not going to be flicking backwards and forwards through the books trying to find different things. Mm -hmm. I remember Second Ed having a lot of issues with this kind of thing yeah. and spending hours and hours of my game prep time basically creating GM screens so that you could keep track of what was going on and always trying to work on one that would make it slightly better. Um, but also the Modifius book, that's got some quite good charts in it. Um, Which Modifius book's that? The, the, sorry, the Modifius Star Trek book uh, had... Some I, very good acudograms in it. I was going to say, I suppose if I'm like bigging up old school essentials, I can't complain about Hannah bigging up the um, the Star Trek vibe too much. Well, we did a whole episode about how much that book frustrated yeah. me because yeah. some of it isn't well laid out and some of it very, very much is. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that um, has been sort of lauded from old school essentials by Gavin Norman is that he's um, pretty much the rules are the basic BX. It's a direct port, it's just old D&D that's been tidied up a little bit to resolve some of the contradictions. But the, the really great thing about it is although he's not really changed the rules a great deal, he's brought modern sort of sensibilities about how to design stuff. Obviously we've learned a lot since like original D&D came out. And he's brought though, those design sensibilities and the idea that like you want to make this game as easy to run as possible and you want to make like minimal having to flip between books and he's brought that design sort of chops to the game which i think makes it a lot easier to run and i'm part of the reason i'm looking forward to running it is because it's a nice synthesis of sort of like the older rules but with new design sensibilities coming into it see another place that i've always found these charts to be really useful is in the actual character gen process yeah having just a very simple rundown that you can hand your player that page and yep. it's got all the page references that they need on it and it tells them what order to go through it in um yeah, that, that's really useful and it's also something that if I'm looking through a new book with a chance of like possibly running that system or looking at playing that system, if I can't find that in the first like 30 seconds of looking through the book, I'm probably going to put the book back on the shelf and go and play Fate or D&D. &D. Yeah, I mean, one of the things about um, OSE is if you... Because it's split, that you get two versions of it. You can get the the rules tome, which has everything in it. Or you get these little books, which are split out into like monsters, treasure, spells, core rules, and then there's a genre rules, which has all the class mm -hmm. stuff in. And again, every sort of class has a double page spread. So if you go, I want to play a fighter. Everything for playing a fighter. I mean, obviously not rolling your stats because that's in the core book, but everything that specifically applies to that class, the level abilities, their XP table, all of that is on that double page spread. So if you had a player who didn't have the book, you could just print out one double page spread and be like, boom, there's your class. Everything you need to know, it's there. Yeah. And I think that's a really useful thing because certainly, especially when you've got new players or like you're a new GM, but also, I myself, as someone who's gamed for like quite a long time, if you say to me, oh, I'm going to run this new game and then go... Oh, by the way, here's like a small like Encyclopedia Britannica's worth of stuff. <laughs> You're gonna have to like read to take part in this game. I've got to admit, I'm not saying it would stop me from playing the game. However, it is gonna dent my enthusiasm for it because I'm gonna have to do all this reading and all this homework. And you might say, "Well, John, that's just you not investing as much in the game." But everyone's got other stuff going on in their lives. Most of us haven't got time to sit down and read these massive sort of monolithic tomes. Absolutely, that's one of the reasons that I really like the Powered by the Apocalypse system. Yeah, yeah. Because as a player, 
I get handed two or three pages where I just go through bullet point, tick, 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 tick. I've got a whole character. It's different from the last time I did it, even if I've got the same playbook. And then I don't need to even look at the rest of the books. I can just sit and enjoy the game as a player. Yeah, and I think that exactly right, love, and I think that's what we're trying to get at, really, with this sort of episode, is if you're if you're a GM and you're starting up a new game with new people, new players, I mean, they might be experienced players, but they're new to this particular game, you want there to be as few barriers as possible between suggesting the idea of the game and then getting them into the game, playing it and enjoying it. Now, if you say, as I was saying earlier, if you say to people like, oh, this is a setting I'm running, it's it's this high fantasy world with Magitech and stuff like this, and you're really selling it to them, you, you've sort of built up almost like a momentum, like you've got their enthusiasm up and they're like, yeah, I can't wait to play this. And you then go, hold on a second, but before you play this, read all of this massive like mm-hmm. pile of material, that's going to knock that back and you're going to have to work to get that enthusiasm back. Whereas if you build up that enthusiasm and then you sort of ride that wave and you're like, oh, here's like an A4 sheet. Everything you need to know is on there. You won't even need to read most of it in advance. You can just look at it as the game's going on. Let's get into it. It's a lot easier to maintain that initial enthusiasm for your players. And you might have people who like love reading the background stuff. People do. But it's far easier to get people enthusiastic about it if they don't have to do a lot of research and homework beforehand. Mm -hmm. And another handy thing about having your turn sequences, just to take it back to the start, um, laid out in such a neat, clear way, is that everybody knows what the turn sequence is going to be. So everybody knows like where their bit is going to take place. So you don't end up with people tripping over each other and people know to hang around for two minutes for their turn in the combat before they run off to the loo or whatever, which is also really handy. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And one of the things I like about having a clearly defined turn sequence and everyone understanding how it works is I'm a big fan of rolling my dice in front of the players I know a lot of people are like, oh, well, if if you're rolling behind a screen, you know, the players don't really know what's going on and it's a bit of a mystery and stuff like that. Whereas I, because I'm not in control of the dice, it's random. I always feel that, and obviously not everyone feels like this, but I always feel like if I roll the dice in front of someone and something bad happens, it's clearly not something I've contrived as the GM for any personal or petty reasons. It's just the way the dice have fallen, them's the breaks. And by having a clearly defined sequence that everyone can see, they can follow your process through it, they can see exactly what you're doing. There's there's not even there's not even any possibility of like the GM sort of doing anything shady behind the screens or like manipulating things, which not all GMs do, and obviously you could say, well that's a trust issue between the players and the GMs. But I think well if you've got nothing to hide, why not just do it all out in the open? See I would argue that occasionally it's nice to not know how well you did on a roll, yeah, particularly yeah. on things like gathering intelligence, yeah. um, trying to uh, divine the future, that kind of a thing. Um, if you make that a secret roll, that adds to the game. Yeah. But 90% of the time, I absolutely agree with you, because 90% of the time, you know whether you did a good job at that thing or not. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. And obviously, even in like old D&D, there's certain instances like thieves moving silently and finding traps and stuff like that, where you're encouraged to roll the dice secretly so the players don't... If they don't find a trap, they don't know it's because they failed the roll or whatever. And the way I sort of handle this is because I run a lot of my games online, so all the dice rolls are recorded in Roll20, is in that there's a function where you can effectively roll the dice, but only the GM sees it. Oh, that's a nice feature. So I use that, I make that roll, and then if someone at the end... I mean, I don't think it would happen with my players. I think we've got a, a level of trust, but if someone did say to me, like, oh, what happened with that? Did you actually roll it or whatever? I could just point to that dice roll that's been recorded and be like, there you go. But during the game, they wouldn't see it. So that's my sort of halfway house sort of way of dealing with it, I suppose. That works as well. Okay, so that's our thoughts on why we think having a clearly defined 
procedure or sort of flow of play is useful in a game. If you've got any thoughts on this, please get in touch with us and let us know. You can leave us a voicemail message using the SpeakPipe website. There's a link in the description of this show. Or you can send us an email to rddrpgpodcast at gmail.com. Until we see you next time, take care, stay safe, and keep gaming. Bye. Oh, we forgot to talk about indexes. It's all right, everybody knows that the World of Darkness had a crap index section. Yeah, and maybe we'll do an episode in the future on indexes. Put, put, put it on the pile. <laughs>